here this morning. Father, I come to you again, and uh, Lord, we thank you that you know all things. And uh, Lord, I pray uh, this message that you have for us this morning, that it would be clear and that you would use it in our lives uh, to help us be more like you, to help us experience the kind of life that you want for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you experiencing life to the fullest? If you could change anything in your life right now, what would you change? The new year, I believe, is a great opportunity to look at your life, to see where you've been, where you are, where you want to be. Now, before you click off the live stream, let me put you at ease. I'm I'm not going to talk to you today about making New Year's resolutions Uh, If you make resolutions, that's great, but if you don't, that's okay too, because statistically only about 8% of people ever end up keeping their resolutions. But I do want you to pause and honestly answer this question. Am I truly experiencing life to the fullest? Jesus said this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's talking about our enemy, Satan. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The NIV puts it this way, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And our vision here at Faith is to passionately and positively impact our community for Jesus so that each person can experience God and life to the fullest. But what does that even mean? The word abundant or full literally means over and above. Life that's overflowing, outstanding, beyond expectation. Is that the kind of life that you are experiencing? Life to the full? Or is your life just full? Full of stress, anxiety, busyness, emptiness. I think it would be safe to say that We all want a life that is overflowing beyond our expectations. But so often we just feel stuck. Like there's this gap between what Jesus said and the life that we are actually living. And so we fill our lives with people and things and activities that we think will make our lives full. And so many of us chase after the American dream of financial and social success that only ends up being an exhausting rat race. In fact, Jesus warned this in Luke chapter 12. He said, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So today, I want to share with you a message of hope. Really, a message of freedom that you can experience an exceptional life that goes over and above your expectations. Because Jesus invites us, and he says in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, does this describe your life? Or would it be more like this? You work hard, but life just seems to drag you down, and you do more, and you try harder, but the weight just seems to get heavier and heavier. The word that Jesus uses here for labor carries the idea of working to the point of utter exhaustion. And it reflects the daily labor of carrying a pack on one's back. And maybe that's how you're feeling right now. And all of us have burdens that we carry. What weighs you down? What weighs me down? I think we can all probably relate to what's going to be shared in this video. You've heard the saying, he's carrying a lot of baggage from his past, or avoid her. Baggage. But think about it. I mean, baggage, it's, we get it from other people, the things that they do to us or say to us. And if we carry those memories around, in essence, we carry baggage. 
We begin collecting baggage when we're just little kids. There you are. Hey, 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 hey I need to talk to you. Yeah, what? Well, um, we were talking about building the, the tree house. So yeah, yeah. I, I love tree houses. Yeah, it's just a thing. Um, see, you can't help us build the tree house. Why? Well, you don't really want me to tell you. Yeah, I do. Okay, well, we were talking, uh -huh. um, um, the gang, we were talking, and, yeah. um, well, you're too fat. What? You'll weigh down the treehouse. I'm not fat. Yes. No, no, yes. I'm not. No, no. Uh, mommy just says I'm big boned. Dinosaurs are big boned. You're fat. No, no, no. Mommy says I'm chunky. <laughs> Peanut butter's chunky. You're fat. No, no, no. no. Mommy says that I've lost weight. I think you found it. No, no, no. Mommy says I'm just different. <laughs> Your mommy says you're just different? Yeah, I'm just different. <laughs> go back to where you came from. I gotta go. Bye. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's one of the biggest lies we teach children. Words hurt, they cut deep. And if we carry around the words of other people, essentially what we do is, we're collecting baggage. You see, we can't, we can't find our self-worth based on what other people think of us. We have to find our self-worth based on Christ and our relationship with Him but it doesn't seem to be that easy. And as life goes on and we get older, we just tend to collect more baggage. Sometimes we pick up baggage from people who are very close to us, like a best friend. No, I, I know, I know, Shelly, I know. It's like we talked for three hours and it seemed like five minutes. I know, I know, I know. It's like we have this amazing connection, this chemistry. Okay, I'm just gonna say this, Shelly. I've never said this to anyone in a really long time, um, but I, Shelly, I feel like you're, you're my density. I really, really do. No, you're right. You're my, you're my destiny. That's what I meant. You're my destiny, right? I'm just so applause. Hey, he's right here. I gotta go. Okay, bye. Hey, buddy, what's up? How much? Who are you talking to? Um, um, talking to my mom. Your mom's your destiny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she gave birth to me and everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Kudos. Really? Yeah. Because it sounds like you said Shelly. Yeah. Um, that's her, that's her name. I thought your mom's name was Kelly. That's her middle name. Your mom's name's Kelly Shelley? Yeah, yeah, and she was picked on a lot when she was a kid, so I just really try to encourage her all the time and tell her that I love her. What's wrong with that? Okay, I mean, okay, great thing uh, whatever, do. whatever. Did you talk to my Shelley? Yeah, I did. Um, and? She's not, she's not gonna be your Shelley. Look, we just started talking. We just we just kind of hit it off. I mean, it just happened. I mean, what? we had this great chemistry. It just... No, 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 no. You were supposed to call her for me. I did. I started out doing that. I did. You no. gotta believe me. You're supposed to be my best friend. I, I am. Don't, don't let a girl come between us, okay? This I is not a big... You did this. Look, man. You know I've liked her since we were in kindergarten, and you were supposed to talk to her for me. Yes, but but I've been your best friend since kindergarten, and we've always said growing up, best friends forever, right? Yeah, well, you know what? Forever just got a lot shorter. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's a you girl. did this. You're supposed to be my best friend. And our friends, they're just trying to get through life the same way we are. And sometimes they're going to make poor choices, and we can either learn to forgive them or we can pick up more baggage. You know, the truth about baggage is we don't need other people to load it on us. We do a pretty good job of dumping baggage on ourselves when we compare ourselves to others. We think things like, oh, if I could be as popular as they are, if I could be as gifted and talented as they are, but I'm not, I'm a loser, I'm no good. And when we think that, we pick up more baggage. Or we find ourselves thinking, they have it made. And why is life so easy for them and so hard for me? I'm never gonna make it. And when we buy into that lie, more baggage. And sometimes, sometimes we pick up baggage from people who love us dearly. They just don't realize that their words cut like a knife. Son. Hey, Dad. What happened out there? Uh, um, the ball slipped. The, the lights got in my eyes. It was 
the lights got in your eyes. Yeah. You know that's what costs us the game, don't you? Yeah. The ball slipped. How many times have I gotten up in the morning before 5 a.m., before I go to work, to work on the stuff with you, huh? There were scouts out there. You realize that? Dad, the ball slipped. The ball slipped. It did. I mean, what, what do you want? Hey, coach. To... Huh? No. <laughs> Butterfingers, yeah. <laughs> we're going to work with them. Uh-huh. All right. See you later. Are you crying? No. Well, don't. Pull it together. People are watching. I want you to grab your stuff. I'm gonna go to the car and I'll meet you there, all right? Dad, I'm just disappointed in you, all right? These were our dreams, right? Grab your stuff. And our parents, they don't mean to hurt us. It's just, they've got their own baggage. And when you don't deal with baggage, you pass it on. And for us, we have to learn to find our self-worth only in our relationship with Christ. And if we don't, we pick up more baggage. It gets uncomfortable, tedious, and our natural tendency is to want to dump this baggage onto someone else, but it always backfires. Hey, can I ask you a question? What are you doing in my room? I just need to ask you a question. What? Can, can you give me and my friends a, a ride to school? It, it, it's cold and I don't want to ride my bike. <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you really asking that? Yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. Just give me a ride and some of my friends to school. You need to understand something. Just because you and your loser friends are in high school now doesn't mean I'm gonna give you a ride, okay? Because look at me, you need to understand that when people look at you, they see a freak, all right? And if they know that I'm related to you, if they know we're brothers, they're gonna think I'm a freak too, okay? And I'm not okay with that. So here's the deal, I don't care how you get there, I don't care if you have to walk or crawl or whatever, but I'm not gonna be a chauffeur for you and your loser friends, okay? It's not my fault that dad left. Why do you keep taking out on me? Whatever. No, you know I'm right. Okay, I'm sorry. You're not sorry, you're only sorry that I'm calling you out. I'll ride my bike. I said I was sorry. I'll ride my bike. Come on. <sighs> and in the process of trying to dump our baggage on someone else, inevitably what happens is we pick up more baggage. And then there's that one, my sin, my secret sin. It's, um, it's cool. I mean, uh, I've got it under control. Who am I kidding? Most of the time it has control of me. And this is the way I live. And yet, I hear the words of Christ who says, I've come that you may have life and may have it abundantly. I don't know about you, but th this doesn't really feel like abundant life to me. Maybe it's the weight of your past poor choices, or the burden of sin, or perhaps it's baggage that you have picked up from others. In Jesus' day, the religious leaders weighed people down with their religious teachings and rules. Not just the Ten Commandments, but all 613 commandments that covered almost every area of life. In fact, Jesus addressed that in Luke 11 when He said, Woe to you lawyers! Those were the uh, lawyers, the keepers of the Jewish law. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. These prescribed standards encompassed, again, almost every detail of life, and they became so massive and demanding that they were all but impossible to learn, let alone keep. So many times you and I think if we can be just good enough, if our good works would somehow outweigh our bad, then we could earn God's love. 
or we could make Him love us more. Let me tell you from personal experience that trying to be good enough is exhausting because it's impossible. None of us are good enough. None of us measure up on our own. But here's the good news. God already loves you. And Jesus calls you and me and He says, if you're exhausted from trying to please God on your own, come to me. Do you want to find rest and a life filled with joy and peace? This doesn't come through keeping religious rituals and rules, but rather through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus offers you and me a personal invitation. Come to me and I will give you rest. And then he goes on. Verse 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. A a yoke was a wooden part of the harness. It was hand-hewn to fit the neck and shoulders of a particular animal or a person, so they could pull a cart or a plow or a mill beam. It was also the means by uh, which the animal's master would keep it under control and could guide it for useful work. The reference here by Jesus is probably to a very well-designed yoke, one that didn't chafe the animal or person wearing it, which distributes the Lord comfortably for the weariness of load-bearing can be considerably reduced by a well-designed yoke. In other words, a better-made yoke distributes the weight better. The imagery was also often used of a student under the yoke of his teacher. Ancient Jewish writing contains this advice, quote, put your neck under the yoke and let your soul receive instruction. So when Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, uh, learn from me. He's echoing an exhortation of rabbinic instruction. In fact, uh, this word comes from the same root word that our word disciple comes. And again, the language is here of a, a rabbi calling, inviting a disciple to follow him. How did that work? Well, a rabbi, a master teacher, would gather around him disciples who would literally follow him wherever he went. Another word that might help us better understand the word disciple would be apprentice. And these disciples would be with their rabbi 24-7. They would live with him and spend every waking minute with him, listening to him, memorizing his words. And as these disciples were with their rabbi, they would become like their rabbi, following his teaching, helping him in his, in his work, and imitating his walk with God. And eventually, the disciples would go and do what their rabbi did. They would be sent out, and they would become rabbis and teachers with their own disciples who wanted to learn how to walk with God. And so here, Jesus is inviting you and me to come follow Him and become like Him. Our mission here at Faith is to make more and become better followers of Jesus. To follow Him as our Master, our Teacher. But what does it actually mean to follow Jesus? It begins by accepting His invitation. When you admit that you've sinned, that you've fallen short of what God wants for your life, that you've sinned, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and came back to life, and you call out on Him and ask Him to save you and forgive you and lead you, that's where it starts. But that's only the beginning. Because following Jesus is an ongoing relationship of being with Jesus, of becoming like Jesus, living like Jesus, loving like Jesus, and then doing what Jesus would do if He were you. So that in the end, others would become followers of Jesus. 
Now, we're going to be going deeper into what that actually looks like in the weeks to come. To be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus would do if He were you. But before we do that, let's first ask the question, why? Why would you want to be a disciple or follower of Jesus? Answer, so that you and I can experience God and life to the full. See, you and I were made to know and experience God. And apart from an ongoing personal relationship with Jesus, this is absolutely impossible. You can chase after everything the world has to offer, but it will always come up short. You can try to live your life apart from God, and you might even find temporary happiness and fulfillment. But here's the thing, it won't last. And one day, you and I we will all stand before God and give an account for our lives and what we did with Jesus. Not to mention that serving anyone or anything other than God only results in baggage and it will weigh you down. And sin and self, including our own self-righteousness, are harsh taskmasters. Timothy Keller said this, Everyone has to live for something. And if that something is not God, then we're driven by that thing we live for. By overwork to achieve it, by inordinate fear if it is threatened, deep anger if it's being blocked, and inconsolable despair if it is lost. In contrast, Jesus says, Come to me, and I will give you rest for My, I am gentle and holy. Jesus was the exact opposite of the religious leaders of his day. He was gentle, not harsh. He was humble, not proud or elitist. He was willing, think about this, to leave the glories of heaven with all of its benefits and privileges for you and me. To be born as a baby, to take on human flesh with all of its weakness and pain and suffering. And he became one of us in order to die on a cruel cross in our place, so that you and I could experience life, life to the full, abundant life, now and for all eternity. And the promise here, he says, you will find rest for your souls, rest for the deepest levels of your life. Isn't that what we want? He says, Why? For my yoke is easy, meaning profitable, useful, good, and light. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't burdens of life. Of course there are. But these burdens are are not heavy to bear in comparison because Jesus gives you and me the strength and the power to bear them. Now you might be sitting there and you're saying, well, yes, that is what I want and I've I've admitted my sins. I believe Jesus died for me, was buried, and came back to life. I've called out on Him, and I've asked Him to save me and forgive me and lead me, and I'm a follower of Jesus, but I I still just don't feel like I'm experiencing life to the full. And I keep trying harder and harder and doing more and more, but I just feel stuck. And I want you to know that I can relate to that. Been there, done that. And all that trying harder and doing more, all it led me to was a point of frustration and exhaustion. Maybe that's where you're at. And the spiritual life became a duty rather than a delight, a burden rather than a blessing. And I want you to know this is exactly what Jesus is addressing here. Because becoming like Jesus isn't about keeping a list of do's and don'ts, of trying harder and doing more. In fact, let me suggest it's actually the opposite. So how do you and I actually experience this life to the full practically? In this series, Rhythms, we're going to be examining the rhythms of Jesus and learning how to practice the patterns of Jesus. John Mark Comer, who's coming out with a book about this, says, quote, The practices are habits based on the lifestyle of Jesus that create time and space for us to access the presence and the power of the Father 
and in doing so, be transformed by the Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. It does require discipline. And that's why they've been called the spiritual disciplines. And yes, it will require some effort. Paul says that we are to train ourselves towards godliness. But here's the thing. It's not about your own willpower. Rather, it's about opening yourself up for the power of God to work in you and through you far beyond anything you can do on your own. We're not attempting to earn the love of God. God loves you already. Rather, it's giving our heart and our mind and our soul and our strength to Jesus who already gave Himself for us and to us. And I want you to know that these practices are only a means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. For example, uh, when we go over silence and Sabbath and simplicity, those things don't in uh, in and of themselves transform you. Rather, they create time and space for God to transform you from the inside out so that you can be a person who exhibits rest, peace, calm. Someone who is not in a hurry, but present in each moment. Grateful, living in the goodness of God. A person who is like Jesus. And isn't that what we really want? But in order to experience this, you and I are faced with a choice. And this is what I want to challenge you to think about this week. Whenever Jesus called someone to follow Him, to become His disciples, they had to make a choice. A choice to follow Jesus was also a choice to leave something behind. The disciples, they left their home, their family, their occupation. Uh, It says they left their nets and immediately followed Him. Jesus was who they followed because they wanted more than anything else. They left all these other things because they wanted more than anything else in the world to be like Jesus. You see, in order to be like Jesus, it means subtraction not just addition. In fact, our theme for this year is not, let me repeat that, it is not about doing more in 2024. You have to make a choice, really. It's about doing less and leaving something behind. Dallas Willard, who did a lot of uh, writing about spiritual discipline, once called hurry the great enemy of the spiritual life. And he said this, quote, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. The reality is that most of us are just too busy to enjoy God. Now, I want you again to hear this. We're not asking you to add more. Rather, we want you to clear your life rather than clutter it. Less is more. And the first step to eliminate what's preventing you from experiencing God to the fullest is really taking an inventory, doing an audit of your life. Because the fact is, you can't do everything. And as you take that inventory, then making a choice to cut out the things in your life that aren't helping you. You see, for everything you say yes to, you're actually saying no to something else. And I want to encourage you, don't let what is good get in the way of what is best. And I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's a a TV program or uh, your time with movies or social media. Maybe it's some sort of side project or hobby. And those things aren't necessarily wrong in themselves. But if they're getting in the way of you, you experiencing God to the fullest, it's time to leave them behind. I don't know what it is for you. But I want to encourage you this year to make time and space to give yourself to Jesus. Because the more you give yourself to Jesus, the more that you will experience the fullness of life that Jesus wants you to have. And then I remember His words. 
works. Christ also said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what I want. That's what I want. So I go to God. God, please, if you're willing, would you take this baggage from me? Because God, I'm miserable and I can't live this way anymore. Please take it. And you know what? It takes it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray now that the Spirit of God would take this message and grip our hearts and our lives. Father, I pray that we would answer Jesus' invitation and take His yoke upon us and learn from Him that we would become, be with Him and become like Him and that we would do what He would do if He were in our shoes. And Father, I pray that this week as we take inventory of our lives, that You would show us the things that You want us to leave behind so that we can experience the life You want us to have. In Jesus' name, Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank Alex for uh, figuring out all the tech stuff. Uh, we could not do this without him this morning and especially figuring out the sound. I also want to thank those of you who financially support the ministries of faith. Uh, you help us and, and you allow us to be able to spread the message of Jesus. This last week, I was excited to see a picture of a Pete and Katie Sargent uh, that they sent us in their newsletter. They are, uh, Pete grew up here at Faith and now together they are serving Jesus with their family in Albania. And, I, and this is what they wrote. Here's the picture, and this is what they wrote. The Christmas Eve service at church was a smash. Praise God, the place was packed, and five of our neighbors joined us. We invited a girl who was faith's age, and she brought a friend. And it was the first time they had ever heard the Christmas story. And they were super engaged. Also, the lady who stopped me in the street to ask about church came and brought her daughter and a friend. And they were particularly excited, get a load of this, about the Operation Christmas Child Boxes. And they took a couple extra for their kids who didn't come to church. And each box had a nice gospel booklet published in Albanian by Samaritan's Purse. And we definitely gained some momentum this week. We ask that you pray for our church and our neighbors as we continue to seek opportunities to share God's love and truth. We want to thank you for your prayers, and I want to thank especially all those who participated this last year with Samaritan's Purse in Operation Christmas Child in donating toward and packing shoeboxes just like those that went to children around the world. Also, if you would like to support the Ministries of Faith, uh, you may uh, give online, you may text the amount to 84321. This week... I hope you stay safe and warm. And my prayer is that you would experience life to the full. God bless and have a great week.